I could get you to open your Bible and mark 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. In just a moment, we'll be going back to 1 Peter chapter 1. But once you've done that, if you found a way to mark that with a Bible ribbon marker or maybe a pen or a pencil or a piece of paper, then turn your Bible open to Galatians, the fourth chapter. Galatians chapter 4. I am a former military guy. I'll tell you more about that later this week. But I guess because of that, I am a big fan of military history, especially American military history, or at least where Americans are involved in it. Uh, If you want to talk about the Revolutionary War, I'm not an expert, but I like to talk about it. I love the American Revolution. I love the Civil War, at least some of the aspects of it, not the actual war itself, but I just... I love the military aspect of it. I love the historical military aspect of it. Especially, my favorite would be between the beginning of World War I and the ending of World War II. I just think that's a very special time in American history. And I especially think the men who served during those eras of World War I and World War II were some of the most remarkable men that have ever been American citizens. They were just amazing people. In fact, there was a a phrase that came out of that to describe the greatness of those men and the potentiality of what would happen because of that. They say, um, hard times produce or create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create uh, hard times. And so there's sort of the cycle that we go through in American history. But I, I love... World War I and and World War II. You know, World War I was known as the Great War. They used to call it the war to end all wars because there was so much world involvement in it. I mean, you had, you know, European Union and and America coming together in the the Allied forces, and then you had the central forces of the Ottoman Empire and Hungary and uh, the Middle East. There were so many, Russia, all of them involved in, in going against what we were trying to do for freedom in the world. And it was, I think, still the most catastrophic war that's ever been. There were 40 million casualties in total in World War I. That's about 20 to 22 million deaths and about 20 to 22 million million injured folks in World War I. So it was just um, phenomenal. The, the, The single greatest battle, I think, still in world history is the Battle of Verdun or Verdun, however it's pronounced, 1916. Uh, There were 1.3 million casualties alone in just that single battle. And you know, back then, most of the battles were fought close quarters, combat, trench warfare, so it was a very hard warfare. And we live on the best side of that military history because we have the preserved records of all of the writings of folks who were a part of that. And there was a letter sent by a 20-year-old French corporal out of the Battle of Verdun, and he wrote to his parents, and he said, and I'm quoting him, he said, Oh, the people that are sleeping in their beds tonight, that tomorrow will awake and read their newspapers and say joyously, We're holding. And then he finished by saying, Can they imagine the sacrifice involved in that simple word, holding? You know, in the Bible, there's a theme that runs from the beginning to the very ending of the Bible. You you could read endless scriptures this morning. We could fill our time just in this service alone, just beginning and reading scriptures with this word in it. If your Bible is open in Galatians chapter 4, I'd like to read just one of those and introduce the concept and then maybe borrow some words from that 20-year-old corporal. Look at chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, Now I say this, that the heir as long... As he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth a son born of a woman born under the law to redeem, that's our word today, to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption 
as sons. And so if you were to go back from the very beginning, even in passages where the word redemption may not be used, the concept is there, but from the beginning of the book of Genesis till the ending of the Revelation, the Bible story is one of redemption. And if I can borrow the words of that corporal, can we imagine the sacrifice that is behind that simple word, redeemed? So I want to talk about redemption this morning. If you can turn your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1, I think this is one of the greatest set of collective verses to explain the scheme of redemption simply to us. And I'd like to begin reading in verse 13, and I want to read down through verse 21, and then I think there's about four main points that Paul, or Peter rather, is making here. Look at verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here uh, in fear. Then he says, knowing that you are not redeemed, there's our word, with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained for, for the, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now, as I look at this, there's about four main things that Peter is establishing about redemption. Now, if I'm listening to Peter carefully, what he's giving me is a great outline. If I'm studying with someone trying to help them to understand what the Lord has done for them, but it's also refreshing for us to be reminded what the Lord has done for us. All right, so let me begin with this one. Number one, in verse 20, the first thing I see in this passage is that he is explaining there was a plan, a plan for redemption. Look at verse 20. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now, when he says that he was manifest in these last times for you, he's telling us about the actual physical arrival of Jesus upon the earth. He's telling us about the, the physical time that Jesus was upon the earth, meaning from his conception and birth all the way through his life and ministry, even including his death, burial, and resurrection. This is the appearance of the Lord in the, in the dot in history in which he appeared on the earth. But notice that he says that he was foreordained for us. What Peter is proving is that God did not wait until the actual arrival of Jesus on this earth to then implement his plan. His plan had been implemented far beyond that. In fact, the word in verse 20, foreordained, would tell us that this has been in God's plan since before the foundation of the world. It's a hard word to translate that idea of foreordain because the word not only means to know beforehand, but it also means to act beforehand. Right? So it means you know something is going to happen, but you make a plan based upon what you know to be certain. And that's what he's describing here, that God knew something in advance and made a plan accordingly. There's a passage in the book of Isaiah in which Isaiah says that he knows the end from the beginning, Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10, to remind us that God knew perfectly what would happen even in the future as men would look at it in the past. I, this, is, this is difficult. Sometimes the attributes of God, we know what they are, but we are finite, and so it's difficult to understand infinite themes. But if I can illustrate it this way, it's the best way I know how to illustrate that God knew in advance that something was going to happen. Of course, His would be in perfection, and ours could be flawed. Uh, let's say that you have here in Crossville... Uh, traffic patterns that would require some local news station to send up a, a helicopter, a traffic helicopter in the afternoon to tell you on the radio what an intersection would look like so that you know whether you could go through it or to avoid it. And we have those in Chattanooga and we have some pretty busy intersections and we have those traffic helicopters that go up 
and they'll report live. They'll say, hey, it looks pretty good at such and such intersection. Well, let's just say that you have such an intersection and you get a chance to go up in one of those helicopters and there you are sitting, you know, several hundred feet, a thousand feet above the ground and you're just looking down. Everything looks like small miniature versions of what it really is and you see this intersection and you see a car that is racing for that, T, that intersection where it's going to cross let's say a railroad track, and you see it, it's going to cross that intersection right at the railroad track, and a train is coming at exactly the same speed, and they're heading just like this. And you can see in advance what you think is going to happen. If that car keeps on going and that train keeps on going, that car is going to get demolished by that train. There's going to be a terrible accident. And in advance of what you anticipate is going to happen, you get on the phone and you call emergency services, and you say there's about to be a terrible accident. And that's the best I can do because it's flawed from a human perspective because that car could still slow down or the train might see it and the train could slow down because we are fallible, but God is infallible. And God in one simultaneous intuition from eternity saw the future because He can see it in one simultaneous intuition just the same as He can see the past and the present. And He knew down the line that there would be a need for Jesus. And He planned for that. Have you ever thought about this? Remember in Luke chapter 2, when Jesus had gone with his family to the city of Jerusalem, and then his family leaves, and they make it about three days out, and they realize that Jesus is not there, and they go back, and they find him in the temple asking questions and debating religious matters, and the people who were there were impressed. And when his mother asked him, why did you do this? We've sought you sorrowing. And he says, I must be about my father's business, which in a sense is a way of Jesus saying, this is where you trained me to be. I've always been about my father's business. I'm here to do this. If he had some knowledge even then of what it was going to take for him to accomplish redemption, don't you know that every single time he walked into the city of Jerusalem, he peered over at Golgotha? We sing it sometimes, don't we? That he left the splendor of heaven knowing his destiny. It's his plan from the beginning that Jesus would come into this world. Now here's the practical effect for me. This is what I love so much about this. I read the story of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. And when he gets to the end of that particular story in verse 10, Jesus says to Zacchaeus, I have come to seek and to save the lost. That's why I came. And that means that God, knowing the future, saw David Smith. He saw me and my need for a Savior. And even way back when, before the foundation of the world, He implemented a plan because He knew what was going to happen so that He could save me and so that He could save you. You know what that proves to me? I matter to God. And so do you. That's what He did in the plan. Now... Number two, Peter tells us about the price of redemption. Go back to verse 18. Did you see this contrast in the passage? You've got the blood of Jesus Christ on one hand and gold and silver on the other hand. He said, knowing that you are not redeemed, you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your father. So that's on the one hand, you've got these physical material things. But then verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So you've got on the other hand, the blood of Jesus Christ. But it all surrounds that word or is involved in that word redeemed. You know what that word I know you know what it means. It just means to buy back at a price. And more specifically, it means to free a slave at the ransomed price. And this is a word picture the Bible presents to us. That if you can see maybe a, an, a courtyard, and there's a platform, a platform in the middle of a courtyard, and on it stand people, and they're slaves. And people are walking up and they're evaluating whether they could take that slave and use that slave. And in order to take that slave off the stand, off the podium and take it somewhere, they've got to pay the price for it. And he's saying redemption is that. It's the paying of the price to free the slave. Now some things didn't work and silver and gold couldn't do that. 
because he says in verse 18, silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. And whether he is there making a reference to the fact that maybe in part of their pagan background they had done things like this before, but he's telling them that all the silver and the gold in the world could not make redemption of the soul. And it's all about the soul. Because over in chapter 2, verse 24, when he says, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, he's talking about something that happens spiritually, not physically, right? So he's saying that spiritually, silver and gold could not affect the soul of man. But I know it could, verse 19, the precious blood of Christ. It could do that. And because of what he says in chapter 2, verse 24, I know he's talking about the death of Jesus. Only the death of the Lord could bring about your salvation, your redemption and mine. And if God planned that back then, then part of that plan would be that Jesus would make a bloody sacrifice for you because that's how redemption is made, because life is in the blood, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, that at some point in history, He would have to make a bloody sacrifice for you and me to redeem us from sin. You ever thought about what that cost the Lord? Let your mind float back for just a second to the garden. He, he was not composed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Every picture that's ever been painted of the Lord, peacefully kneeling on a rock and lifting up His hair all gently combed and, and lifting it up, that's not what the Lord looked like on that night. I mean, the language that's used in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and somewhat in John to describe the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane and all the things that happened that night show us a night where He was in panic attack. I mean, he falls flat on the ground, and Dr. Luke describes him as, as it were, blood coming out of his, his sweat glands. It could have really been the case that he was just bleeding through his sweat glands because of the kind of duress that he was under. Hematidrosis may have been what he was experiencing that night, but he was in some sort of a shock, a panic attack, begging that his father could find some other way to do that. That's the cost of redemption. That's the price of it. And then on top of that, to be led away after you've been humiliatingly betrayed by one of your best friends, Judas, led away to six mocking, belittling trials. And don't forget what they did to our Lord in those. Remember, they blindfolded him, the Jews did, and they tied him and they, they spit in his face and they were mocking him. Can you imagine being spit in the face? And they were punching the Lord? That's the price of redemption. That's what he paid to set you free. That's what he paid to set me free. They took him to, you know, the next morning to the Romans because the Jews had no authority to put a person to death. Capital punishment had been removed from them because they had abused that power. And so the Romans only had that right. And Pilate finds out that he's innocent. So he tried to appease the bloodlust of the people. He scourges the Lord. You know what that's like? They tie the victim's hands high above his head so that the skin on his back would be stretched very tight like the skin on a drum. And a man whose name was the lictor, the professional torturer, would stand a certain degree and a certain feet away so that the extension of his arm would bring the most force on the back and he would have that flagrum, that cat of nine tails where you'd have those leather strands with small, par small sharp pieces of sheep bone and small lead balls and he would start to bring it across the back of the victim and it would lacerate the back of the victim so that there would just be quivering ribbons of skin hanging off of the back and the Romans had even so perfected the art of, of that torture that they could sometimes remove the skin and expose the internal organs of a man and still keep him alive and if he had happened to pass out they conveniently had buckets of salt water nearby that they could just pour on the back of the victim to keep him pain sensitive and awake. That's the price of your redemption. That's what it cost. And then if it wasn't bad enough, Pilate brings him out in John 19, 5 and says, Behold the man, as if to say, isn't this enough? Haven't we done enough to this innocent man? And they shouted the more, crucify him. So you know what they did. Takes him to the Praetorian Guard. They put the crown of thorns on his head. They take a reed that was originally in his right hand. They take it from him and beat the crown of thorns like nails into his scalp, one of the most vascular areas of the body. And they lead him away after they put that robe upon that freshly beaten, bleeding back of Jesus. They led him off to, to Golgotha to crucify him. When he was there, they put nails in his hands and feet, probably with enough flexion in the body that he would have to struggle for every single breath that he would take. He would have to put the pressure on both the nails in his hands and feet just to breathe in and breathe out. And yet he said seven of the most remarkable statements in human history while he was upon the cross. But that's the price of your redemption. 
When Peter says, knowing that you are not redeemed with those things, but with the precious blood of Christ, he's building a word picture. Those persons standing in the slave market, that's you and me. We're on the podium. And the Lord walks up and says, how much to set David Smith free? It'll cost you your life. I'll pay it. That's the price of redemption. Number three, look at the power of it. Isn't that amazing? In this passage, verses 18 through 21, there's some implications about how powerful his sacrifice was because we want to know, well, just how powerful was that sacrifice? How powerful was that redemption? Well, notice it was powerful enough to do away with Old Testament sacrifices because his was a singular offering as opposed to the millions of those in the old. Have you ever ever thought about just on one single day how many sacrifices could be offered under the old law? Hold your place here. Go back with me to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 8. It is a long chapter. So go down to verse 62. Verse 62. This is when they're dedicating the temple, right? Solomon built the temple. They're dedicating the temple. Look at this. Then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord. Now watch this. 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. So you got 22,000 bulls, 120,000 sheep in one day. Scholars of history tell us that on the feast days in the city of Jerusalem, that there were somewhere upward of a hundred, or let's see, I think they say it was 1.3, 1.3 million sacrifices that I believe could be offered in a single day, depending on the crowds that had come in annually. A million, over a million sacrifices in a single day. Can you imagine the blood that flowed from the temple? You know how many sins they ever forgave? Not a single one. Hebrews 10, unless they were connected to the sacrifice of the Lord as a part of redemption, in and of themselves they had no efficacy, no power to do that, and they never forgave a single one. But Jesus' sacrifice was so powerful that it trumped them all. He just had to do it one time. It's also so powerful that nothing else was needed. So again, back in the text in verse 19 and in verse 18, he says, not with silver and gold. See, if you have material things like silver and gold, there's always more that's needed. But not the sacrifice of Jesus. In and of itself, it was sufficient to provide redemption. It was enough to pay the price of redemption. I love the statement in Hebrews chapter 7, about verse 25, when he says that he is able to save to the uttermost. That means that his sacrifice is so powerful that it can actually procure redemption for people. He can actually buy people out of sin with what he did. It's amazing what he did in redemption. I'll offer one more thing. Back in verse um, in 1 Peter chapter 1, if you look at verse 13, and you go down through verse 17, this is the practical effect of redemption. Right? This, is what, this is what redeemed people should be responding with in response to what he has done. When he says, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also must be holy in all your conduct because it's written, be holy for I'm holy. And then he talks about our sojourn when he says, you do this throughout your time, your stay here in fear. He's talking about how that It's supposed to transform us to where we act and think and we talk differently than we did before because that's what redemption is supposed to do for us. If you are a redeemed person, the life you live now as a redeemed person is not supposed to look like the life you lived before you were redeemed. It's supposed to be better than the life you had before. Everything about you is better now. I'm a child of God. I've been redeemed. We sing about it. We're supposed to reflect it in the way that we live. And it's supposed to continue for the rest of our lives until He calls us home whenever that may be. Whether we die in this life and our bodies go to to the ground and our spirits go to paradise or whether we get to see the Lord come back in His glory. But, But we stay faithful to Him because we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So He had a plan for it. There's the price of it. There's the power of it. And then there's the practical effect of it right there in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 13 through 21. 
Now this morning, if you are not a Christian, I want you to do anything else except listen to me right now because this is the most important words I'm going to say. If you're not a Christian, you can change it right now today. There are, some, there are some conditions of pardon that God places in the New Testament under the New Covenant, right? We live under the New Covenant, which, which is ratified by that blood He shed on the cross. You, you have to believe that Jesus is who He claimed to be. And if you believe today, based on the evidence, you've examined it, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And, and you're willing, based on that, to repent of your sins. Repentance is a change of mind away from a change of life. It means that in our mind, we don't want to be a slave to sin anymore. And so we turn away from sin in our mind. We don't want to live that life anymore. We're doing an about face away from it that you would then confess that Jesus is the Son of God. You would be willing to admit what you know in your heart to be true, that He is God's Son. He's the Christ. I'm willing to say that out loud. If you can do that today, then you can go down in water and you can be baptized for the remission of your sins. In the same book in which he talks about redemption, in 1 Peter 3 verse 21, Peter will say, the like figure, the antitype of the waters of the flood, he says the, anti, the antitype now which saves us baptism. Meaning that, that baptism is the culminating act in which we contact the saving blood of Jesus Christ. That's when the price is paid for our redemption and we are bought out of sin. Because we're standing on that platform. We are lost and we need redemption. This morning you may be a child of God. And maybe you're not faithful. And maybe the problem is not that we were redeemed the wrong way because there's only one way to be redeemed. But maybe the problem is we've forgotten the, what the effect should be in our life. And we've not lived as redeemed people should live. And we need to come back by repentance, by confession, and by prayer. There's going to be some elders to help take that confession, and, and if you need to do it publicly, they'll do that, and they can have prayer for you, and, and it'll all be in the past, and we can leave here as redeemed people. But in this room today, everybody's in need of redemption, and the price has been paid for that. I remember hearing a story one time about a, a little boy. You may have heard this story before. as a little boy, and um, his dad had, had gotten him some supplies, and he, you know, little tools that he would work around. And he said, one day I'm going to build a, a boat, Dad. And so he built a, a small boat that actually would float. And he painted it and put a sail on it, had a string attached to it. And his dad took him out one day and he put that boat in the lake. And he let the string, let the boat go out into the lake a little bit. And he was just so absolutely proud of that boat. Spent a lot of time making it. And he didn't realize the wind was so strong and it snapped the string and the boat just went off into the distance and he was just mortified that he had lost this one boat that he worked on. A few days later he was going through town, he was walking down the street, the little boy was, and he looked in the little five and dime store and there was his boat, his boat sitting in the window. And he walked in and he said, Mr., that's my boat in the window. He said, son, I, I don't know that to be true, but I do know that somebody brought it in and I bought it from them and if you want it, it will cost you a dollar. He said, sir, I don't have a dollar. He said, that's what's going to cost you a dollar. And so the boy went and he did some jobs for his dad and he worked in the yard and he scraped together everything that he had and he finally had a dollar and went in and he bought his boat back and he walked out into the sun and held that boat up and just screamed out loud, first I made you and then I bought you. He has made us all. Now he wants to buy you. The price of his life. I am redeemed. I hope you are too. As we stand and as we sing.